works great. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, um, I was asked to, you know, talk about the ToxCast program, which is an EPA program, but really what I'm going to tell you about is a much bigger collaborative effort between a number of groups at the EPA. We have collaborators at the National Toxicology Program and elsewhere at NIH, the FDA, and a number of academic and government and industry collaborators both here in the U.S., here and in Europe. So, you know, it's a, it's a very big collaboration where we're all working on different parts of this problem of solving the too many chemicals problem. So it's, it's not just us. Okay, but the, so I am in the, the CompDoc Center at the EPA, and we were founded six or seven years ago really to, to deal with this problem, the too many chemicals problem, which we've heard about over and over again today, so I don't need to talk about numbers too much, but we just know that there are lots of chemicals out there. Most of them have never been tested in the standard animal tests, so that's, that's one issue. You know, how can we take thousands of chemicals and run consistent set of tests on them? And then the other issue is, okay, there are chemicals where we actually have, you know, rodent to your chronic cancer bioassays or multi-generation assays, and quite often it's hard just looking at the animal data to understand the human relevance. So there's actually need for more mechanistic data, and, and uh, Isla talked about some of these, these acronyms, modes of action, adverse outcome pathways. So if we can dig in and do in vitro work, we can both potentially help this problem, the too many chemicals problem, and bring more human relevance from the expensive data we've already generated. Okay, so we and, and our collaborators have come up with an overall strategy, and there are, you know, variants of this, but this is the basic idea. So, first of all, we identify these pathways, and again, Isla did a good introduction. There's, there's a lot of terminology, a lot of deep science about what, you know, is it, is it a, a toxicity pathway or an adverse outcome pathway or a mode of action or a mechanism of action, and you have academic you know, doing all this, you know, trying to own the terminology, but it's really, it's, it's some complicated biology that's happening in the cell. And we can go, you know, mine the literature, talk to the experts, and identify a number, quite a number of these pathways that, if you perturb it, has a good chance to actually ultimately lead to some sort of toxic effect. And then what we do is we go and we work with a lot of smart laboratory experts to develop in vitro assays. So assays that are either run against bare proteins or in cells or maybe as complicated as in zebrafish. You can actually treat whole zebrafish in a little, you know, in a little well and you can tell all sorts of stuff about them. You can say, do they have developmental defects? Do they glow green? Do they grow blue? And so on. And you can test thousands of chemicals in these sort of assays. Okay, then having generated these big data sets and, and the biggest data set we're generating today in the uh, cross-agency TUX21 collaboration, there's 8,200 chemicals which are, you know, environmental chemicals, uh, consumer products. You know, we heard about flame retardants. There are a bunch of flame retardants there. There are food additives. There are things we put on our skin. There are drugs and so on. So we can, we can generate a lot of data for up to, you know, 8,200 compounds. Then we need to take, we have to start off with some good in vivo data. Because what we want to do is finally make a predictive model, and I'll talk a lot more about models, where we take this in vitro, cheap to generate data, and in silico models, so QSAR models, for those of you who, who think about taking chemical structure and making predictions. We can, we can take the in vitro data, uh, QSAR models, and find some model which maps from those onto in vivo endpoints. And you do that in, to the point where it's accurate enough for use. It's not 100%. I know exactly what's going to happen if I put this chemical in a rat or in a human, but it's accurate enough to do prioritization. You know, that was sort of a theme of this uh, the session, and it's really a big theme of what we're doing. We're not trying to re replace animal tests yet, you know, maybe one day, but if we can do prioritization, that's good. So now once you have those models, then you can take a new chemical where you don't have the animal data, and you can run the, the cheap assays and make a prediction. You know, does this look like it might be a carcinogen? Does it look like it might be a developmental toxicant? Okay, then, you know, the last session we talked a lot about exposure. You know, hazard doesn't, doesn't mean anything if you don't have some estimate of exposure. And so you have to have exposure models which are equally high throughput. You have to be able to make some sort of prediction for thousands of chemicals. And I'll say a little bit about where we're folks at the EPA and our other collaborators are working there. 
And then once you have those models, you have hazard models, you have exposure models, you can then start talking about prioritizing chemicals for targeted testing. And I'll show one example from the endocrine program at the end. And, you know, we, we think we can either, even get to the point where we're making some sort of semi-quantitative estimates of risk, so a, a poor man's risk assessment. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so that, that was the basic strategy. And the pieces, we have this, these high-throughput screening assays, and there's lots of technology here. We did not, the EPA didn't have to go pay for a lot of technology development because most of this was done by the pharmaceutical industry. They've, you know, because they spend a billion dollars developing every drug, and so they've had a lot of money invested in, in basic technology, which we were able to go essentially buy off the shelf. And so there's a variety of, of kinds of assays you can run. You, these models, where you just start with structure and you run it on the computer, <coughs> there are assays that are run in cells, assays running zebrafish or, or C. elegans, or if you go back to cells and just say, tell me what's going on with every one of the 20,000 genes in the whole genome, you can do that. Right now, this is actually too expensive to do for every chemical. That'd be great if we could do that. You'd get a lot of data, but it's, you know, thousands of dollars per chemical, which is just too much. But the, the Broad Institute, two weeks from now, is finally releasing their first big data set with a with a version of this chip that's getting down to hundreds of dollars per chemical. Okay, and so that puts the realm of doing whole genome analysis for every chemical that we're exposed to within the realm of possibility. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly go through three approaches for doing this modeling. So imagine we've got all this in vitro data, we've spent our money, put it in a database, and then we have built a database of high quality toxicity data, rodent data, rat data, so on, and ToxRefDB is just one of the databases our group has put together, and the ToxGuest database is where all the in vitro data is, and you just build basically statistical models. The first thing you do, you start off, say, let's just treat all of this in vitro data as just a bunch of numbers. You know, you, the chemical either turns on that pathway or not, and you treat all the in vivo data as just a bunch of numbers. This chemical either causes cancer or it doesn't. I mean, it's, it's very easy to do. A lot of groups is, have done this. We showed, I don't know, six, seven years ago it doesn't work. For, for a variety of, you know, statistical power issues, there have been a number of groups who've come along and, and proven that it doesn't work. But, you know, it's, it's the simple thing to do, and, and we all tried it, and it doesn't really work. So what you have to do is actually put some biology in there. Okay, if you, if you, we just don't have enough data to let statistics drive everything. So the next level and this is a really complicated diagram, but it's, you know, it's what we call the adverse outcome pathway approach. And a lot of groups are doing this, where what you do is you take a, a, a really good postdoc, sit them down with a problem, and say, okay, I, I have some evidence that if you perturb, for instance, the VEGF, which is a particular pathway that's involved in vascular genesis in a developing embryo, you can, you can <coughs> cause <coughs> certain kind of developmental defects. And so, for instance, thalidomide, we all know the thalidomide phenotype, that is partly caused or largely caused by disruption of vasculogenesis at a particular stage during fetal development. Our, our smart postdoc then works out that, you know, going to the literature, VEGF actually, actually disrupts cytoskeletal signaling and endothelial cells, and if you do that, then it leads to this and that. And they can essentially come up with, by scanning the literature, all of these particular pathways, going from an initial chemical interaction with a pathway to something happening in cells to something happening in tissues to something happening in the, in the whole organism. And so you can make hypotheses about specific, you know, okay, chemicals don't don't cause toxicity by magic. They cause toxicity because they, this environmental chemical interacts with some biological molecule. So we can actually posit the beginning part, the key in the, the lock, is interaction with CCL2 or notch or whatever. And then we can go and look in our database of in vitro assays and say, what chemicals interact with VEGF with the aerial hydrocarbon receptor and so on? And do they actually, do we see this signal passing through here and causing those defects. You can actually now start doing a reasonable job of predicting the kinds of chemicals that we've tested that will have these kind of phenotypes. And we, there's some very detailed, complicated, new, uh, what we call uh, targeted testing experiments where we're doing in collaboration with a number of industry groups 
to try to work out specific pathways here for specific chemicals. So this is shown that you don't have to solve all the problems for all chemicals, but by having this big database, you can take specific chemicals and understand a lot of detail of what's going on through the, all the way to the toxic endpoint. Then the most complicated bit of modeling is you say, instead of treating, you know, the, the cells or the organs as a, as a uh, you know, it's just a box, actually start modeling individual cells in the body. And this is, this is a movie, if, if I had it set up to run a movie, you'd see this is, this is developing limb bud, and these, this is the wave front at the end of the limb bud with particular uh, pathways turned on. And so we can actually model the effect of what's happening with thalidomide on the, on the developing limb bud. And it turns out that, that by hitting VEGF and some of those other signals, you turn off these critical pathways that are having to interact at the, at the tip to, to essentially cause growth to continue going. If you turn that growth off by turning on some of those pathways at the wrong time, it will never start again, okay? And you have a limb bud that never goes. And so we can actually then take a chemical we've identified hits the pathway, and you can actually look at the dynamics at the level of, of cells and groups of cells. Okay, so that's, that's really, you know, the, a, a big idea of how to actually do the hazard. Think about hazard both in a, in a, in a detailed way or a less detailed way. Okay, the next thing we want to do is start thinking about, you know, risk. How do we start getting towards risk? And a second piece before we get to exposure is actually pharmacokinetics. We, you know, many of you know this. So we've developed a, at least a strategy we call high throughput risk assessment where we first of all identify hazard pathways and a concentration, quantitative concentration, you know, one micromolar, one micromolar, this chemical turns on the pathway you don't want turned on. And that, that estimate actually has some uncertainty around it. Okay, but then we need to know what dose do I have to take? What oral dose do I have to take to get to one micromolar? So that's pharmacokinetics. And this was a, an approach, again, that came out of the pharmaceutical industry. Rusty Thomas and the folks at the Hamner, you know, sort of brought it into toxicology. And you can do some relatively simple, cheap experiments. You do two experiments. You measure the intrinsic clearance, the clearance rate of a chemical in just liver cells, which could either be a rodent or human, and plasma protein binding. You put into relatively simple computer models, and now you can actually calculate what we call the CSS, the concentration at steady state for daily dose, which is just the conversion factor. If I take one mg per kg per day, what's my steady state concentration going to be? And you can, you can go beyond steady state assumptions. But again, there's some uncertainty there. You put those two together, and you come up with what we call the biological pathway altering dose, which is the dose you would have to take as a human. And you can think about a big human, a little human, an extensive metabolizer, a poor metabolizer that would turn that bad pathway on. And so this, if you look at the low end of this distribution, this is a quantity which is really equivalent to a poor man's reference dose. Okay, so all in vitro, a few, you know, maybe $1,000 to get a, a reference dose for a particular pathway. It's, you know, it's an important, you know, important caveat there, but it's a strategy. And we've shown a couple of cases where you get within about an order of magnitude of what you would get when you did the animal studies by doing this full in vitro plus modeling approach. Okay, so we have hazard, we have pharmacokinetics, and you have to put the high, th high throughput uh, exposure, and we have a, a, a program, you know, it's well behind where the, where the toxicity part of it is, but the ExpoCast program to start doing high throughput modeling. And we can actually, you know, we've shown you can, you can make exposure estimates for 10,000 compounds. Those exposure estimates have really wide confidence intervals today. Okay, so a, a big effort over the next few years is, is to reduce those, and, but you can still prioritize. Another piece, it turns one of the most critical pieces of exposure is how is this chemical used? So that drove an effort, you know, this is our latest database, the latest piece of actor is the chemical product category database, CPCAT, which where we've captured use information for about 40,000 compounds. Um, skip a couple of things. Okay, so we have lots of grand ideas. There, there, there are problems in my slides. I skipped over. I skipped over all the problems. I'll just okay. But having having said that, though, because I got the one minute warning, the EPA is confident enough that that you can do prioritization. We're not going to 
We're not going to ban a chemical or say a chemical is you know, really bad or really good because of this, but we can, we can start prioritizing chemicals. And the pr first place is the endocrine disruptor screening program, which has a big problem. Okay, it's this, it's this you know, congressionally mandated program where there are about 5,000 chemicals that have to go through this million dollar per chemical screen, and the whole world's testing you know, capacity can test about 50 to 100 chemicals a year. So we have, we have 50 to 100 year backlog, and we have a $5 billion problem there. So what we really want to do is say, all right, we know the pathways. The pathways we have to worry about, does the chemical hit the estrogen receptor, the androgen receptor, does it, does it disrupt thyroid signaling, and so on. We can actually do a lot of that in vitro. We can do the exposure assessment. So this is just in, this is the, uh, uh, you know, the first real world application of all of these ideas that's going to happen at the EPA. And we're, you know, we've actually started and I'm hoping it won't be five years before decisions are made, but it's, you know, it's before five years, I think we'll have some, some outcomes there. Three, okay, Tina says three. So thank you, I'm run out of time. Met all of my expectations. Thank you for leaving out all the problems. In 2012, Governor Brown appointed Gina Solomon, Deputy Secretary for Science and Health at the California Environmental Protection Agency. Prior to that, she was a senior scientist at NRDC and has been on the faculty in the Division of Occupational and Environmental Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. She is board certified in both internal medicine and in occupational and environmental medicine. Welcome, Gina. 